Good morning. Welcome to today's video. What we're going to cover today is the APDS 9600 color sensor. It's a fascinating, very tiny little device. It's very capable and it does an amazing amount of functions in such a tiny little package. One of the ideas that I wanted to explore with this experiment was to do with a way for the Zoomy to, we'll call it, communicate within the environment. And what I mean by that is uh, we as humans, as we're driving our cars or riding our bikes along an area, if we see an octagonal red sign that says stop, it's communicating us an action, just as our traffic lights with red, yellow, and green communicating to us what we should do. Well, we're going to need that same uh, functionality, so to speak, within the Zoomtown experiment as the Zoomies are moving around. With this particular sensor, we can detect color. Now, you might be thinking, oh, gee, why don't you just uh, use uh, optical character recognition and a vision system and you could read signs? That's really expensive. We simply don't have that kind of money to put into this project. So I'm looking for more primitive ways to communicate the same information. Now, the way I'm kind of thinking this would work would be probably on the roadway surface. We could put uh, colored flags there, uh, red tape, green tape, yellow tape, whatever it is I'm trying to communicate, and then have the sensor looking down. A more cool approach might be if the sensor is pointing out the right side of the vehicle. Here in the U.S., our cars are going to be driving on the right side, so Zoomtown will be right side drive. Uh, but if there's a sign over there, maybe the sensor could pick it up as it's passing by. Now, before we get into any more details, let's first take a quick overview of how we'll cover uh, or what we will cover in this video. We'll give a brief explanation of the color sensor and its applications. We'll look at some of the features of the sensor. We'll use a practical setup, including a schematic or fritzing diagram, and some code, MicroPython is typical, to perform practical testing with this particular sensor. And finally, we'll wrap it up with an analysis of the sensor. So with that, let's take a look at where I purchased the particular sensor I'm working with. And it was Amazon. They do a great job of distributing a lot of these little electronic modules that are very useful for us tinkerers. The other aspect of it, oftentimes where we have to resort to ordering from a uh, a specialty electronics house, which are great. I love it that they have all these things available for us. But if I'm going to buy a $4 sensor and it's going to cost $25 to get to me for shipping, it's not worth it. Amazon, in this case, uh, I got two sensors for $8.99, free shipping. That works out to $4.50 each. Now, that's still a little on the steep side for a sensor, but if it does the job, I'm all for it. They don't go into a lot of detail in their description, but that's not really needed. As long as we know the model number of the sensor, we can look at the data sheet and garner more information there. As you can imagine, with a sensor of this type that can do so much, you can get into a lot of detail of all the capabilities and all the information needed out of this data sheet. From our application, or for our application, I'm really just concerned about its uh, color sensing ability, and it's going to color sense using RGB uh, for our color channels. Uh, it works with an ambient light, and it has UV and IR blocking filters, which is kind of really important in our situation. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to have to light the whole layout. Right now I've just got overhead lighting, but I might need more lighting, and that can greatly affect the ability of the sensor to deal with color recognition. They claim it has very high sensitivity, and it's ideally suited for operation behind dark glass. Maybe that's a hint we need to do it. I'm not exactly sure, 
but in a lot of practical applications, you'll often see cameras and uh, light and color sensors hidden behind dark glass. So we'll look at that as time goes on, should we get that far. The other thing that's always very important is uh, the power supply. In this case, typical is 3 volts. We'll be running it off of 3.3 volts. And the amount of current, uh, the supply current that it needs, and it's all listed here in microamps, and the values are really not very high. So I'm real comfortable that we're not going to be draining our battery dead with two minutes of use with this particular sensor. Then the data sheet goes on to all the different uh, data registers because it is an I squared C sensor. So you've got to read and write a lot of different registers. Thank goodness there are people that love to write uh, libraries for us, and I don't have to go through that just to test out the sensor. To understand the wiring of it, I created a little drawing in Fritzing showing the APDS 9600 module with its header and the uh, assignments for each of the pins. The ones that we're concerned with would be the I squared C, which is SDA and SCL, and then of course the voltage and ground uh, inputs and they're connected to the pins as shown here. Nothing really exotic or confusing. On our test setup, I literally just wired it straight to the Pico, no breadboard or anything like that. It just works out uh, very simple when you got your headers, you got uh, DuPont jumpers, just plug things together when additional uh, devices aren't needed, such as resistors. Now, while I've got this on the camera, this is the whole module. The device, let me get something small to point with. The device is right there. I'll try to get this a little closer to the camera so you can kind of see what I'm pointing at. It's this little device, and this is a relatively small screwdriver. So that guy, he is the actual sensor. The rest are supporting components and a PCB big enough so that we can mount it to something. Fascinating device with a lot of capability. I did find a library online that would give us access or full access to this device. It was written by Rune. I'm going to guess how he wants the name pronounced. Langoy, L-A-N-G, number zero, Y. Uh, not sure how, how to pronounce it otherwise, but uh, I extend my appreciation and thanks to this person for creating the library. These are often extremely difficult to write, and this is a pretty lengthy library, and I think he's done a, he or she has done a remarkable job. Thank you. For our code, it's a very simple little program, not a lot to it. Uh, we need to import a few libraries. We're going to initialize the I squared C bus. This particular function is going to determine which color the sensor is seeing based on a taught in set of values. So the function will receive the reading values of R, G, B, and then R, T, I'll explain separately. When I trained the colors, I was taking this sensor, holding it over each color, like so. And then I created this little diagram or this little uh, comment area here with the average values from those readings. Uh, this was just to make it easy to read because I took these values and put them down in this list. Now this list gives us a color name, R value, G, B value, and then this item right here, or element in the list, is going to be used as a intermediary number before we make the final decision. That'll make sense in a moment. Uh, so at this point it has no value other than zero. Because we're going to be doing a comparison between the taught value and the reading, the taught value is coming from this list, the reading is coming into the function through the passed in variables. So if a reading, RGB reading, was equal to 
the values here, then we, were, we would be 100% positive that it's the color orange. But the further from a sum total of zero of error, the less likely that would be the perfect match for a color. So, if I take the R reading, which was passed in, and I subtract the ideal reading, which was taught, so if red came in as 327, so 327 minus 327 would be 0. If G came in and it was 126, so G minus 126, 0. Finally, if blue came in, blue minus, in our case, 89 would be 0. So all three error amounts would be 0, which gives us a really close match. Now the further deviation, or the greater the deviation, the further from a perfect match we would find. So this loop is, I'm sorry, this loop here is going to go through exactly this uh, for each color and compare the reading against the sensor data. Down here, we'll look for that lowest possible score for each color. Then we'll make a decision on who is the lowest is the actual winning color, the match. Sounds really complex. It's really not. All we're going to do is compare the sensor against the trained value. The closer to zero all three colors are within that reading, the closer, the better, the closer, the match. And that's it. And then here we'll print out that data. We'll go through, I just got a few variables here for the main loop, uh, setting, presetting some data, and how many samples. These types of sensors often require multiple reads. And so I've selected 10. I actually earlier on had this value up around 100, which took a long time to take all those readings. But I think I got pretty reliable and consistent re results with just 10 samples of each color before we process that data. And that's what's in this part of the main loop. Uh, we're going to set a thing called a time ticks underscore US. This is a device I use to measure how long this sensor reading is going to take. Remember, that's very important for our application. I can't have this thing spending a whole second trying to determine what color the sign is. In one second, the zoomie could be already 10, 12 inches away from the sign. So, very important uh, aspect of what we have to do in our testing. Here we're just going through all the samples, uh, going through up to our total number of samples, 10 of them. We'll read the sensor. Uh, this A is for ambient light. Our, our concern would be RGB. We'll read each of those 10 times through here, and uh, we'll add those into a variable R, G, and B. We'll take and divide that each RGBV, RGB value by the number of samples to get an average for each color. And then I'm going to calculate the time it took to do all that. Because in truth, it, I'm not concerned about one read. I'm concerned about this whole process to make the cumulative reading of average of everything. It has to do all of this each time it needs to detect a color. So that's why there's a lot more code in here than you would normally see with some of my tests. So the math after that is we got our start time minus our end time, and then we use this function to get that difference. And that's that extra element that I put in the variables we're passing into the function, runtime. So we go back up there. That was the runtime. And then we will print that out after we show the low scores, uh, which color it is, the low scores, and then the read time uh, for all those reads in microseconds. Keep that in mind because you'll see a very large number. And then past that in the loop, it just cleans up the variables, resets a few things. We'll wait 100 milliseconds just to give time in between the readings and for the print statement to complete. So with all that, let's take a quick run 
across our colors with the sensor. So I'm going to get this running. And you'll see right now down below here, it says winter is blue. And uh, it's giving us a, a value, a read value, and how long it takes to read. So it's 10 milliseconds, which is a really long time uh, to do this. 10 milliseconds or 10,300 and some microseconds. So 10 milliseconds is kind of a real big negative for me. I could reduce the loop. Uh, number of loop times through the loop, but then I also lose accuracy and reliability for the readings. But let's go along here. I'm just going to hold the sensor up above it, and it's hitting yellow with a, ver uh, a probability value of 200. If it were zero, that would be a perfect match. Here we've got uh, it's looking at this color thinking it's a perfect match for green. Fascinating. That was just taught a little while ago. Now I'm moving the sensor around trying to get it to catch cyan and it's just not going to cooperate. This is a little concerning. This was working very reliably just a little while ago. Let's try this one. Okay, purple it sees pretty good. Very close to a zero value. Green, very good, again. Orange, almost down to a zero at some time, so that's a really good reading. And then blue, so it's looking really good at this point. We'll go back to the top, yellow. It keeps getting green and cyan confused. Purple, green, Purple, uh, oh wait, that's not purple, that's orange. There we go, orange. And blue. I think we're spotting a problem here. I am going to move my sensor closer down, and I'm hoping you can see what's hap. I think I understand what's happening. Notice over here, it's a very bright yellow, but underneath is a shadow. And with that shadow, it's starting to misinterpret the color because it's thinking yellow is now purple. And the closer I get to yellow, it turns to blue. This sensor is incredibly sensitive to ambient light, shadows, etc. Blue it did good, or cyan it thinks is blue. Purple it thinks is blue. Green it thinks is blue. Orange it thinks it's blue. And blue it thinks it's blue. See what's happening here? With the shadow, it's interpreting it as the closest relationship to the darkest color. I got an idea. I'm going to mock up another sensor uh, test thing here, and we'll be right back and see if we can get some better performance out of that one. Unfortunately, the other test rig that I had didn't solve the problem reliably. Uh, let, me, let me show you what we got here. This is the same sensor, and I had it on this little L-shaped or Z-shaped bracket. And what I was expecting to do with this uh, test rig was figure out the optimal height from the, the color, uh, be it tape or sticker, whatever it is, to the sensor so I could get reliable readings. And that was its original purpose. But I was thinking that the shadow was what was messing us up. And uh, this had an LED already on it. And it's a white LED, and I thought, well, maybe if the shadow's messing it up, we'll just give it consistent lighting as best we can. So, got it all together, retrained the colors, because obviously the brightness or the ambient light is very different. Retrained all the colors and started running a more consistent test, if you will. I've got consistent lighting, consistent distance from the sensor to the surface that we're measuring, and unfortunately, it was kind of disappointing. So let's, let me show you what we've got. It's kind of, 
kind of crowded here, but I think we'll get it. The code is basically the same program, and uh, here it's doing a really good job. It's found yellow. We'll go to cyan, and it thinks that's orange. It thinks purple is orange. We go to green, and it's reading green. We'll go over to orange. It thinks orange is green. And blue, it's getting a real good reading on. Now, if we go up and down, we can see we're going to get variations as well. At this point, um, I'm not going to totally write off this sensor. I think it has merit. I think the concept that I want to uh, experiment with has merit. But I'm not comfortable with the variances in readings I'm getting in a fairly controlled environment here. My overhead lighting is very good here. Uh, this is a pretty ideal situation compared to the road track where it's going to be running. Uh, so there's a couple things that are really bothering me. Of course, the variations in these readings, not a good thing. It's got to be far more reliable than it is. I mean, if I can't teach the colors and then a few minutes later test it and not get correct readings, that's a huge concern. The other thing that was really bothering me is 10 milliseconds to get that reading. Now, I could take a greater number of readings for a greater sample and average that, but again, that's chewing up a lot of processing time that I don't want to be wasting for one simple or single feature that we have to deal with. So at this point, I'm going to say the sensor is really cool, but I don't think it's going to work for my application. So I need to come up with yet another way to uh, get data or have the layout, the road surface, communicate back to me some form of conditions, such as stop, yield, merge, caution, go, something of that nature. So that'll be the subject of a video coming up, uh, hopefully pretty soon, because I want to get going further along with this project. So unfortunately, I think we're going to wrap this one up on kind of a sour note, uh, but I look forward to seeing you next week, and we'll be covering another sensor. I'm not exactly sure which one we'll cover, but we'll be taking a look at that next week. So thanks for watching, and hopefully next week we'll have some better results so that we can move this progress bar forward.